University of British Columbia and Simon Fraser University Digital Salon. My name is Richard Cavell and I'm the coordinator of the speakers series uh, this year and I'm very happy to be welcoming David Gerfner uh, to the salon. I met David in August uh, when we were both attending a text editing um, workshop given by our UBCO colleague, Connie Constance Crompton, Crompton. Uh, and that was a very interesting experience. I learned a lot there, and it was a pleasure on that occasion to invite David to give this talk. Uh, many of you know David. Uh, he is a settler scholar and assistant professor in the First Nations and Indigenous Studies program. His research focuses on Indigenous new media and digital storytelling, particularly the ways in which Indigenous artists, storytellers, and programmers engage with the land via technology and traditional innovation. As a teacher, David aims to empower Indigenous and non-Indigenous students with the skills and confidence to tell and share their stories via old and new media, he offers workshops and classes in digital storytelling, podcasting, blogging, gaming, radio broadcasting, and website development. As a researcher, David is currently at work on his first book, A Landless Territory, theorizing indigenous new media and digital storytelling, and he is the co-editor of the collection Read, Listen, tell indigenous stories from Turtle Island, which is forthcoming from Wilfrid Laurier University Press. David lives on unceded Musqueam territory with his wife and two children, and the topic of his talk today is indigenous storytelling in cyberspace. Welcome, David. I, uh, my bio seems so much fancier when <laughs> And notice that twirl across the table. I know, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, so that, that's a good way to get started. Thanks everybody um, for coming out today. It's um, great to see people that I've worked with in different capacities over the years, to see folks interested in the digital aspects of my work and also in the indigenous um, aspects. Um, I, I, I want to point out just before we get started, that this is being uh, broadcast by a periscope. Um, we, my research assistant, Lauren, is, is doing the filming back there, so if it looks like she's doing something suspicious, it's just, <laughs> it's just that. And I guess I'll also say hello to, if there are any people uh, on, on the internets right now who are watching this talk, um, we're welcoming them uh, here as well. Um, so as Richard said, my name is Dave Gerner, um, and I'm a limited term assistant professor in the First Nations and Indigenous Studies program. Uh, here at UBC, this is my third year with the program, um, and I'm also a settler scholar of German descent on both my mother and my father's side. My dad was born to a farmer in Tisdale, Saskatchewan, and my mother was born uh, an army brat on the Tawasan uh, Army Base here in British Columbia. So I come from two very different but very steadfast um, spaces of settler colonialism, um, the farmer and the, or farming and war, I guess one can say. Uh, and uh, for the most of my life, I've lived here on unceded Coast Salish territory, except for a couple of years during my MA where I was on Treaty 1. Uh, and I'm very, I feel very lucky to now work uh, and live on unceded, the unceded traditional and ancestral territory of the Hunkamina speaking Musqueam people, which as you all know, is beautiful territory. It's a great place to raise a family, um, to have young kids running around, but it's also an amazing place to work with community, and I really do owe a debt of gratitude um, to the Musqueam community and the conversations I've had um, with the folks there who really helped push my research and my responsibility and accountability doing digital research, what that means in relationship to Indigenous community. So um, I just got to um, the Musqueam community, and I thank you um, for their, their feedback and support that I've had. So the talk that I'm going to give today um, is called Indigenous Storytelling in Cyberspace Research and Teaching landless territory uh, and it is I'll talk about this image later and it is based on a couple of forthcoming articles um, that should be out um, I'm sure many of you know they're like it'll be out next month but whatever that means 
but these are in the last stages and they should be coming out soon. The first from the American Indian Culture and Research Journal um, on work by Scalinati uh, and Kevin Lee Burton. Um, and the second in a collection of approaches to indigenous litter from Wilfrid Laurier and Kress, um, which uh, should be out, we're hoping, for um, MESA and um, Congress. And then this work is building towards a monograph that I'm currently at work on called um, A Landless Territory, Theorizing Indigenous Meaning and Digital Storytelling. I'm in some conversations with um, Oxford um, University Press about that, although it's in the very beginning um, stages right now. So the center of the research I'm going to be talking about today, you probably already noticed the repetition, um, is on this idea um, of a landless territory. Um, so really germane to my work is this misnomer um, that I call it um, in the phraseology that comes out of cyberspace in the 90s um, through work like William Gibson's Neuromancer, Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash, and then the boom around virtual reality that's happening at the time, that cyberspace is somehow this other land that is abstracted from the one that we occupy right now. Uh, and this, uh, as critics other than me have already said, that this really comes out of the Cold War and the fear that we are destroying the Earth that we live in now, um, so we better build a new one that we can occupy. Um, so cyberspace becoming this space that is really um, another land. So for me, working in indigenous studies, um, the question becomes, how do we theorize um, a landless territory in relation to critical indigenous studies, which is itself um, intimately connected with land? So how does work in cyberspace um, speak to the work my colleagues are doing uh, in land-based pedagogies um, and in literary nationalisms uh, and in things that are expressly connected to the land around us? And so the argument um, that I try to make, that I attempt to make, is in fact that cyberspace is not landless, and that indigenous artists, programmers, and authors are doing some of the most important work in making very concrete connections between land um, and digital spaces, and bringing cyberspaces to bear on the land around us uh, and on our bodies um, and communities. This is just, this is one of the beautiful, I like to just show these posters off, one of the beautiful posters that was designed when I first taught my uh, Indigenous New Media class back when we were at NSP. Um, but you can see here, this is the question that I work with through most of my work. So how do we articulate cyberspace, a landless territory, um, within the discourse of Indigenous studies? <clears throat> so that's just sort of a brief theoretical framework to think about um, as we move through. Uh, in the next 30, 40 minutes or so, I thought I would just lay out a brief um, itinerary. This is more so to keep myself on track than really to tell you what is coming up. I find more and more that I use slides in my teaching just so I know where I'm going. <laughs> um, but what I'm gonna do today um, is basically move through three sections. Um, first, uh, how did I get here? Um, I think it's important to talk about um, how I, as a, a white, scholar with a PhD in literature, arrived in a First Nations um, and Indigenous Studies program and working in cyberspace. Um, basically, so describing sort of my path here, getting at the stakes of my engagement with this research um, and my responsibilities and accountabilities to that community. Um, I also think, so think it's important for us as digital scholars in this moment right now to tell our origin stories because the digital humanity still is a burgeoning field. And we have so many narratives coming from so many different places uh, that I think it's good for us as a community to share those stories uh, and to also bring other people who might be um, resistant to new media and technology and to show them the many different ways we can get at this work and encourage people to maybe dip a toe um, into the digital as well and show them some examples about how um, we do so. From there, I'll get into a bit of the analytic work I'm doing, um, looking at starting with Scalinati's um, foundational cyberspace piece, um, Cyber Pow Wow, and then moving to some more current work from the Musqueam artist Helene Sparrow uh, and her great pod play Ashes on the Water. And then finally, um, because the most gratifying part of my job and most enjoyable is the teaching and the work I get to do um, with students here, I'm going to really use the last bit to sort of show off some of the awesome stuff that's coming out of uh, the new media class right now and stuff that um, my students are doing. Uh, both as a way to show how we can use uh, new media practices critically uh, in, a, in a 
classroom space and also the way that we can use them to let students tell their own stories and communicate them across different topics. So I'll start um, with how did I get here. Um, so in 2000, um, 11, 2010 to 2011, I was finishing a dissertation on discourses of reconciliation in Indigenous and Canadian literatures. And I was having one of those existential moments of crisis that I think all graduate students have, where I was questioning the very efficacy of the research that I was doing and the point of it all. Um, I've always been very invested in the power of story um, to change minds and to allow us to imagine otherwise. Um, but at this point in my research, uh, most of the work I was doing was with my notes buried in a book, creating poetry, novels, um, and a ton of theory. And I started to think about the effects of that and what it really meant for reconciliation um, in, in this alienating act, what can be very alienating, of just reading. Uh, uh, books are often a way for me to disconnect myself from people. I often read a book on the bus because I don't want to talk. <laughs> um, so I started to think about different approaches to storytelling um, and different venues for that and how we might start to think about uh, questions of sovereignty, self-determination, recon reconciliation, um, and representation in other storytelling um, spaces. Uh, and my interest in tech sort of led me towards the digital um, from the beginning. I have a story about playing Dr. Spates of, um, when I was a kid. I don't know if anyone remember the that early DOS-based psychoanalyst that you can play with online, <laughs> but I won't. We, we can talk about that later, that's an aside. <laughs> but that is a foundation of sort of my interest in tech and communication. Um, so at the time while I was making these decisions, the Swami Cree artist Kevin Lee Burton um, was getting a lot of notice in the press. He had just won a Webby for the work he'd done in God, on God's Like Narrows, which is an interactive website about his home community of God's Like Narrows. So it seemed like a really an obvious place to start. Um, and it was, um, as soon as I got into it, it was to my, um, my glee of the really a smart, nuanced, and rich piece that really lent itself to deep reading and teaching and was really a point of access for me. Um, what I really, what I guess initially, besides the press, what really drew me to God's Lake Narrows, um, first of all, was that it was not a web-based piece initially. It was actually an installation at the Urban Shaman Gallery uh, in Manitoba. So you might be familiar with the Urban Shaman, quite a famous and important indigenous art gallery. Um, but what Burton had wanted to do there is his home community, his, the home, his home reservation, it's 550 kilometers outside of Winnipeg, and it's only accessible by plane or boat, and on, even then, only under the very best of weather conditions. So it's very disconnected um, from what, what we would refer to as the South, the North versus South divide, um, and in Burton's estimation, creates a lot of negative stereotypes about reserve life and the people that live in it. So part of his project in bringing it to the urban shaman um, was to create a very warm, intimate space uh, where Southerners can be introduced to his community of God's Lake Narrows um, in an ethical and responsible way. So he called it um, building an intimate community um, where he had a small <coughs> fire, there were pictures of his cookum, um, there were birds cut, painted onto the walls, um, there was soft music playing, and then there was all sorts of different um, artifacts and pieces of writing um, on God's Lake Narrows. And it was a very warm, welcome place that was just as much, as much as an installation about the representation of indigenous people um, as it was an exploration um, in uh, welcoming and hospitality. So my interest knowing this piece was then, well, how the hell do we think about um, this warm space um, as we translate it um, into the landless territory of cyberspace, um, into the cold field of binary and ones and zeros? Um, how does an artist with Burton's talent and insight um, think about this idea of hospitality. How does he make it work um, in cyberspace? So that was my initial uh, point of entry um, to start thinking about it. I'll bring up the site now so you can have a, a quick look. So after he produced this um, for the Urban Shaman, uh, the National Film Board approached him, Alicia Smith, who's a producer there, um, and asked him if he would work with her to turn it into an interactive website. 
um, to which she obviously agreed, bringing the photographer, uh, Anishinaabe photographer Scott uh, Benjamin aboard, and uh, indie rock darling um, Christine Fellows. So if you're a Weaker Dance fan, you might um, be familiar um, with her to put this piece together. And how he decided to um, concoct it um, in terms of this idea of welcoming was really break it down into two sections. So in the first section, we have a series of sh exterior shots of the different houses on the reserve. They're taken curbside, I guess. There's no people in these shots. Um, there's the big blue skies, the snow, um, and it really is um, capturing what he calls um, of the reserve aesthetic um, of those spaces. You'll notice, as one of my students just pointed out to me, they used to always say all these shots were unpopulated, um, but she says that she can find a, a res dog in almost every of the shots. Um, so I don't see it here, but <laughs> Dakota um, tells me this was <laughs> how she was spending her time. Um, so interspersed between, and again, this is interactive, so you control moving back and forth through it. In interspersed between um, the exterior shots, uh, we have text about the history of colonization, um, residential schools, the Indian Act, and what really led to um, what he says is almost the third world conditions of many reservations in Canada. So really giving you a history um, of how this space um, exists um, while still celebrating the warmth of the community that's in there. Um, also giving you a sense, like as he says here, getting at the idea of, of visitors and guesthood. The only white people that pass through here are on temporary jobs. I'm giving you a sense of how non-Indigenous viewers are moving um, through the space. And then the second half of the piece, um, once you move through this information, this history of indigenous schools, um, of residential schools um, and colonization, there's this moment um, of transformation um, and crossing the threshold um, where we move from exterior to interior um, in these pieces. So now we're moving into the homes um, and we are um, put in the gaze of uh, for his friends and family. So these are his brothers, uh, his sister, his nieces, his nephews, his friends, his aunties and uncles, um, who now stand um, and look right at the camera and then right at us as we enter into these spaces. And there's, you might have noticed the sound in here is not very sound. Um, but there's a, Fellows does a really good job of changing the tone of this piece as well. You might have noticed in the first half, the dominant sound is a dial tone along the background, sort of signaling this idea of disconnection. Um, and beneath that dial tone, we have voices that fellows actually recorded from the community. Um, so from the bingo hall, um, from the CB radio, they used to communicate. Um, and then the, the sound of feet crunching through snow. Once you move inside, the dial tone disappears, and there's a much, you can hear the voices much more clearly, and we get guitar and banjo that are supporting the work there. So again, evoking this idea of welcome and warmth um, within the space. Um, without getting too much more into the analysis of this, I just want to draw your attention to what I think is, there's lots that's wonderful about this piece. You can find it on NFB if you just Google it. But one of the things that really caught my attention but didn't until probably the sixth or seventh time, I think I was actually teaching this when I noticed this, is how Burton uses geolocation uh, in this piece. Um, so if you're not familiar, what geolocation is, um, it's basically a system of coding that the HTML5 has really revolutionized. But how your computer, using your internet protocol address or your IP address, um, can tell um, the host oh, precisely where you are. Um, so there's a, an author who just wrote an article on HTML5, uh, and, and he was uh, just exploring it, and he realized how scary it was, how this code could point not only where his home was, but even so far as to where he might be within his home. So this is really precise um, coding. Um, and Burke uses this, I think, in a really interesting way, and I argue bringing together internet protocol um, with indigenous protocol. And so far in this moment, as this is one of the first slides as you move into the site. He is telling you how far you are away from God's Lake Narrows. You'll see the kilometers right there. And then below, how far um, I am when I took the screenshot um, from the nearest reserve, which is, of course, um, 
plus win here. So there's the set, this is the sense of the user being compelled or even forced to identify themselves before they move into this space. So really interrupting what the internet does is to create this feeling of anonymity, this very anthropological settler sense of entitlement that you can move through these space without ever locating yourself. Um, this piece is saying, no, you've done that already. Um, we know this about you as you move into this site. Um, and this is reflected in the end as well too, um, where they have the credits, the about the site. And um, while you're watching it, Burton actually steps into the frame um, and in a video loop and looks right at you while you're reading the about too. So there's this sense of accountability um, and responsibility to the piece, um, which I think um, the digital really allows him to speak to. Um, so um, as I got into this work, I started teaching it in my Indigenous Lit classes. I gave a presentation at Congress and I realized how excited I was about this work um, and where it could go. Um, and also that if I wanted to keep doing it, that I needed to do um, some more research and I needed to get back into the archives and understand um, the labor that went in before this moment that allowed Burton to create this kind of work. So I started going back to the digital archives, doing research there, um, doing a lot of reading, and really what I was trying to do was to sort of find a year that I could build up from. So when do we sort of see a year then where indigenous cyberspace really becomes a thing? and how can I build out of that? Um, and so the year I came up to um, at that point was 1996. Um, sorry, I have a bit of a cold, so you'll pardon my cough drops and the clacking around in my mouth. Um, so I made a bit of a ridiculous collage here. Um, these are one of the things you do late at night, right, when you're putting slides together, um, where I tried to capture what was going on in 1996 and some of the significant moments. So of course we've got the Spice Girls that show me the money. We've got some politics here. Um, but also there's some really important things technologically that were going on at this time as well. So for instance, uh, in 1996, we had more than one search engine, <laughs> you might remember. Um, but also 1996 was the year that IBM supercomputer Deep Blue um, beat grandmaster chess player Gary Kasparov in a best of three chess match. 1996 was also the year that in North, North America, the number of um, host computers, that is computers in homes connected to the internet, the World Wide Web, jumped from 1 million to 10 million. So this is a year when uh, society's relationship to technology and cyberspace is really fundamentally changing. Not only um, in its development, but also how we understand what the computer and what cyberspace can do um, out of this sort of anxiety, you know, we'll go on to see movies um, like Terminator, for instance. Is how is technology, how are we under threat by technology in this moment? So a lot of anxiety about what it can do, but also a lot of hope for what technology can bring to us in the future. Um, and this is something that's reflected in the work that indigenous um, artists and authors are doing as well. So 1996 is also the year um, that pre Metis author, um, filmmaker, Vancouver resident, Loretta Todd, publishes her foundational narrative, Aboriginal Narratives in Cyberspace, which came out from MIT Press that year. Um, 1996 is also the year um, that the Mohawk artist, Scalinati, um, public, um, releases or starts to conceptualize Cyber Pow Wow, which was the first interactive online indigenous art gallery um, that really um, changed the way that indigenous narratives were told um, in that space. Um, I unpack this, the contributions these two make to the field a lot more in my, my article for the American Indian Culture and Research Journal. But I, I think it's important to point out here as well too um, that we have um, two women making this contribution um, at this moment because it's necessary to contextualize what was going on in cyberspace right now. And cyberspace still is a very violent, sexualized, white, colonial space where violence against women is still enacted. Uh, Gamergate is the most obvious example that's going on right now. Um, but back in 1992, Atari released this um, atrocity of a game 
um, Custer's Revenge, in which the object of the game was basically to rape an indigenous woman. Um, and I, I question whether I would show this slide um, or not, because I think it is so gratuitous and, and terrible. But really, why I decided to show it is to just show the tenor of that space and really what people like Todd and Scott Day were pushing back against at the moment um, and the risk that they put themselves at uh, in, um, in speaking to the power and clearing space um, for indigenous storytellers. So what I argue um, is that what Scalinati is doing at the moment is really to decolonize cyberspace um, and the white male um, semiotics and, and the violence that's going on in that space and to carve out a space for indigenous authors and artists, programmers, particularly indigenous women, to create um, and share their own stories online. So what Scott and Eddie did literally is she took this software that um, was pretty big at the time, it was called the Palace. Um, so in 1996, chat rooms were all the rage. Um, <laughs> Uh, Time wrote a huge article about how chat rooms were revolutionizing the way we communicate. Um, and what the palace did was to um, capture um, and proliferate that um, by adding images and graphical representation. So before chat rooms were text based, it was a white background, you had a name, um, and then you basically just wrote in a Times New Roman font um, to other people. What the palace does, though, is they allow that communication um, to go through avatars. Um, and what is particularly unique about the palace is that you are allowed to create your own avatars. So you can see those sort of tennis ball looking things. Those are sort of your essence when you subscribe to the palace. But then you could build your own representation on top of that. And you could do it from your own um, photos and your own artwork. So if you had a picture of yourself, on your computer, you could then represent yourself in space. Or you could, of course, misrepresent yourself in that space um, as well. And it also, what the palace did, um, was allow you to change um, the setting that you were in as well, too. So, um, as you can imagine, in the palace, most places are pretty typical, like you would imagine. They were, the settings were bars and lounges. There's even a, a really gross hot tub <laughs> in place. Um, but, same with the avatars, you could build your own spaces using things like Flash, HTML, um, JavaScript, which was really big at the time, um, to develop your own setting. And so what Scalinati did is inviting um, her friends and fellow artists. Um, let's see if I have some names. Um, so people. Um, like Lori Blondo, Dr. Pachawas, Jason Lewis, Sheila Urbanowski, Jolene Rickard, um, and even Audra Simpson, um, who we know more as a critic than um, she wrote some fiction for this space, but inviting them in to create um, their own art pieces um, out of the backgrounds and avatars um, in Cyber Power. Um, then the idea being um, that this would be an art gallery opening of such, where they would have events and launches, um, which she hosted, of course, online in Cyber Pow Wow itself, but also in friendship centers, um, gallery spaces, um, community halls, um, where people could come and also partake um, in these events. So really trying to break down the digital divide in that sense. So this is actually a screen grab from the second iteration. Um, there in one of, I think this is a Sheila Urbanowski room here. Um, you can see Bree and sort of a broken Pauline Johnson uh, avatar there. We also have someone from Tank Girl, that's actually Scalinati herself, um, there. And there, and there's some of the conversation um, going on um, in this space. Um, I'll just show you a couple, or three of the rooms. There's, I'm just going to show you three of over 70 rooms here that almost um, no research has been done on. Um, Candace Hopkins has published a small section on cyber power, but only in the midst of another essay. Um, this is an image that I often show from Joseph uh, Tehrana K. Lazar. It's called Vega One. And I often use it because it really, I think it captures the moment where we have two Mohawk people on the edge of cyberspace about to cross over into the divide, which is, of course, what cyber power is. So uh, the FNSP is just a signification of my avatar as I was moving through that space. 
just to give you the idea of some of the breadth, this is an HTML poem by Sheila Urbanowski. Um, the core of the poem itself is very much just sort of a post-structuralist um, piece on the way that writing creates alienation from self. Um, it's called well, What I Do and What I Really Mean, how the act of writing separates you um, from who you might think you are. But it's also embedded, um, as you can see, um, within HTML tags. So there's this other layer of information there and this other layer of reading. Um, so when I teach this, I will get students to actually put it into an HTML reader um, so they can see how computers read poetry um, and what it means to add that other extra layer of information there. Uh, and then finally, this is some work um, that I've been looking at more closely recently um, by um, Hasu Masquen uh, Eskuwe, who was a real leader um, in the indigenous community and unfortunately passed away much too young um, in the late 90s. Um, but this was um, from a series of rooms that he did where he was remediating pictures from his family um, and creating portals and access to different rooms. You can see all the different frames here. Um, any one of these is clickable and they allow you to move through the rooms in different spaces. Um, some of them take you to, one of them takes you to a residential school, one of them takes you to a site somewhere overseas in World War II, um, one of them takes you to a swamp. Um, so really, he's sort of piecing together narratives through photographs and using digital interaction and hyperlinks to allow you to move through the space in different ways. Um, so, um, I guess part of what I want to touch on with this is the kind of work that I've done with Cyber Powwow. Um, like I said, I'm a lit theorist and I'm um, a theorist at heart, and most of the work I've done has been sitting and thinking about text. But in order to get Cyber Powwow writing, I had to do a very different kind of work that has been interesting. So when I found out about this, um, there's only a few pieces online, and I was like, well, how do I get into the palace? Um, the only way, if I'm going to research this, I need to get in there. So I got in touch with Scalinati through some friends um, and to see about setting this up um, in my offices at, at FNIS, um, which became a major challenge. So the Palace Software, Time Warner, they, they dumped that a long time ago. This was not a money maker anymore. Um, and so that software hasn't been supported for ages. And Scalinati simply didn't have um, the time, money, or person power to keep that working. Um, and so it's basically been dark since 2000. I'm sitting on a computer in Concordia. And so I got a hold of her, we talked on the phone, established a bit of a rapport, and I was like, well, can we get those running over here at UBC? Because I have students and community members who would really like to get in um, and see this work. And so the issue then became is how do we transfer those files um, from Montreal to Vancouver? How do we get them on Dropbox was the first issue. And then how do I get them on a computer? So these are files from a decade ago. They're not gonna go onto a MacBook Air. So a lot of my work was then traipsing around campus, knocking on doors, I mean, looking, I needed a PC, and I needed a PC that didn't run anything newer than Windows XP. <laughs> so I was literally knocking on doors saying, do you have any old computers that you might be throwing away? <laughs> um, and it turns out we found one in the offices. And then the next stage, of course, then the was taking those files off of Dropbox, not only installing the images, but also installing the software that would play those images and allow people to move through it, which is way beyond my pay grade. Um, I'm a book, I'm a, I'm a nerd, but not that kind of nerd necessarily. <laughs> so it was a crash course um, in learning how to install those files, which I eventually did. Um, and of course, the other piece being here is that um, Scalinati let me know from the beginning um, and was part of her giving consent to work with this piece is that always to keep in mind that this was an experience meant to be done live. These were never supposed to be static pieces of art that people just stared at. You were literally supposed to be part of the art. Your avatar became part of how that work moved. And in fact, Lori Guando actually figured out a way to hack the technology. Um, and she would, if you went into her room, you were reduced to a one tiny pixel. Um, and then she had music play that she recorded from her community, and she led a round dance through that space. So there would be all these pixels moving um, in what looked like a constellation of stars in a lot of ways. But this is all to say that this is supposed to be an interactive live environment. Um, 
And I, well, I have the files and I have the software, and they're at my office, um, and I ask if you want to come and play with them. It's not live. It's a canned version. So part of the work now with Scalinati is thinking about how we can make it live again. Um, so when I get students in it, I get them to do it as groups. Um, I get them to talk about it. We do it in class together to think about it. But we're going to be, with the help of FNIS, we're actually going to be bringing Scalinati here uh, in the spring term. Um, and she is literally bringing a box full of floppy disks of screen grabs um, from the original Cyber Pow Wows. Because I was like, those are on floppy disk? <laughs> but we need to figure out a way to translate those files. And so we're going to move them into new formats, but we're also thinking about some sort of gallery opening or space where we can have those pictures up and people can materially move through them and have the conversations that we're meant to be have. So really, almost working backwards in terms of technology um, and what we can do for it there. Um, so there will be more information about her coming to visit. She's going to be doing a lecture and a workshop while she's here as well, too. Um, so that should be um, exciting. Um, so I'm going to move, moving from Cyber Pow Wow, um, like I said, um, this was a very different kind of work for me. Um, and what's nice about the field is that there's so much rich work to be done that I can do the other kinds of work I'd like to do as well. So the, the next piece I'll talk about um, are pod plays. That, did anybody experience pod plays while they were here? They were part of the Push Festival initially. Um, so pod plays are pieces of interactive digital theater that you download onto a smartphone and then you take to a specific place on the land or in the city, a very specific place. Um, you put in your headphones and you push play, and then much like you would do uh, in a gallery or, muse or a museum where you would wear the headphones, um, it then guides you through the land, um, but it also layers a story on top of that land at the same time. So, that I decided to work with, which of course got me excited right away, was from the Musby Myers Fellini Sparrow. Um, she doesn't like it when I call her an artist. She, for a storyteller or an actor, um, she wrote the piece Ashes on the Water, um, which is set right down here. It begins on Alexander near Maine. Um, so you might know the alibi room. Um, and this is the path that it takes you on. So up over the bridge, under the bridge, um, and then right into Crab Park. So Crab Park is the primary um, setting for this piece. Um, Ashes on the Water tells the story of the woman's paddle song, um, which is a very uh, famous song from the Squamish uh, nation that documents the moment when Squamish people rode across the Burrard Inlet from the North Shore side to save settlers from the Vancouver side from the 1886. So the women's paddle song was actually set um, in rhythm to the strokes of the paddles um, as they moved across. Um, and after you hear it once, um, you'll notice that you'll hear it at a number of events um, around. And it's really an important um, piece. Um, in Ashes, the story is told from two different perspectives. Um, one from a young settler mother who is trying to save her baby from the fire. Um, and the other from a Squamish woman on the other side who is contending with her resentment and anger towards settler culture and how it has displaced her people and then how those two narratives sort of meet together um, in the water here um, as they are saved. What I think is particularly effective, and I just taught this on Monday, so it's kind of fresh with me, is how this piece um, really um, transforms and moves um, its audience members and how it moves students. Um, I get all my information from um, my headphones these days. I'm a dad and a scholar, so any moment of leisure I have is just listening to music or a podcast um, in my head as I move from one space to another. Um, but what this piece really captures really well is by bringing a story into such an intimate medium and plugging it like directly into your head. And so you start by the alibi room here by a bank where the fire is reportedly said to have begun. If you look up, there's actually a plaque commemorating it. And then you're asked to cross Main Street. And while you're doing that, the narrator says, look down, think about your feet. Now imagine the concrete turning into wood planks. And as she is sort of saying this sort of hypnotic chant, the sound that is 
from the real sound around you um, that starts to be eclipsed by the soundscape of, of 1886 that a sound designer has made. So the, the sound of wheels on a wood road, the sound of voices, and then as you move further, the rising sound of the fire um, burning down Ben and Hoover around you and people screaming um, and yelling. So it really is quite an effective a moment of transportation. So, which is to say, this piece not only moves you through the space of Crab Park, but it also moves you through the time um, of that piece um, as well. <clears throat> so, I'll play a little. This is the, the trailer from from Ashley. That's. Assume to be firm boundaries before, between the material and the digital. Um, on Monday in my class, we got into a really interesting discussion about how the different sounds blurred and how at the end you're standing listening to the water that's played in the recording and then you take your headphones off and you're hearing the literal water um, around you. Um, but also in how this podcast um, is giving story um, back to the land sense, but also decolonizing what has become a really fraught um, colonial space. Um, if those of you who don't know the history of Crab Park, um, there's a, a very long history that um, going way back before colonialism, this was obviously a really important space for Coast Salish peoples um, in terms of gathering food and meeting for community. Um, but in 1886, just before the expo was slated to come here, they actually wanted to put, this is where Crab Park was which, where Edgewater Casino was supposed to go. Um, and that was resisted by a really early Occupy movement, um, where people came down and set up tents on the beach. Um, and this is all based out of research Nicholas Blomley has done up at SFU. And they set up um, what, what they called um, a white man's totem pole um, to like, claim to that space. And under the slogan, whose fucking park, our fucking park, the R, purposefully being vague there, rallied to protect that space um, and create a real accessible beach, which is what CRAB stands for. So in effect, saving that space under a lot of things that we might associate with critical indigenous studies about protecting land and space, but doing it by aligning indigenous presence. <laughs> um, by really erasing that, this idea of like Kultarkos, Herbs, and Elias, right? Of erasing indigenous presence on that land. So part of what I talk about this piece is about how what, a lot of what Helene Sparrow is doing um, is bringing these um, indigenous stories back to that land and asking us to think about a place that is considered within a leftist discourse quite often um, to consider it from a different vantage point. Um, so part of, of the importance I see um, there. Um, I'm not, I won't, yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna nerd out too much with my continuums. Um, I will move to the, um, the teaching, um, just in closing. Um, so, um, like I said, I wanted to share a little of the great work that um, F and I as students are doing in new media, and also to talk about how I'm using new media in the classroom. This is a picture just taken about a month ago of um, F401 Indigenous New Media students in the brand new studios at CITR on the campus and community radio station. Um, where we partook in a three-hour workshop on how to produce stories for radio, um, including how to um, record and edit them using Audacity, um, which is sound design software. So the pedagogy theme here is that giving students 
um, hands-on skills in professional sound design, how to use a board and mics, and how to edit sound using professional software, um, but also a practice um, in terms of literature um, of close reading. So the assignment here is for them to record a podcast, um, a very short one, and rather than have them futz with what they're going to do, I just give them a short story. So in this case, um, Butterflies by Patricia Grace. And then their job is to remediate it, it's one of those buzzwords on the field, um, into um, a radio play, basically. And what they have to do is then to read that text very closely and think about the sounds they want to put behind it, think about the different voices they want to inhabit different characters. Um, and then since we have everybody doing the same piece, um, we play them all together and we think about the different ways students have read and interpreted these texts and the way that these medias um, have allowed us to do so. I was going to play a clip from one of them, but the sound in here is just not good enough. Um, if you're interested, if you look under the hashtag 401F, um, from the last two years I doc I, we've documented um, all of this work. Students submit their assignments through Twitter um, so we can share them. And get engaged, and they are all, and they are. It's also a way to archive that work. Um, so if you go to 401F hashtag, you can see some of these podcasts that are up there. They're really, they are quite beautiful, and the way that the students interpret them is really interesting. They bring in drumming. Someone actually did some translation into Hakamino um, at one point. So the variety of different ways to think about it is really great. Um, although I do have plenty to say about the ethics of Twitter and blogging that we can talk about if people are interested. Um, but I wanted to move into the others. Um, podcasting, I've already talked about that importance. It's been a really successful endeavor doing that. Um, the second is website development. Um, so I think it's important in learning media classes to lift the veil for students. Um, it's a, the very, in the Wizard of Oz sense of lifting the veil and to show them the language behind websites. So what I'll get them to do is I'll show them how to access source code um, on websites to show the language, how we can manipulate source code, even on something like Facebook, um, how there is a language right there that we can easily get into and look at. Um, and then base, I give them very basic training um, in HTML and CSS, um, so hypertext markup language and cascading style sheets. And I get them working in an HTML writer so they can write um, in the basic language that these websites um, are all using. Then we start working with this software, um, which is called Twine. It's open source interactive storytelling software. So it's free to use, um, and it works on the very basic principles of HTML. And the whole idea is to create stories that sort of follow the aesthetic of a choose your own adventure. Um, so you can hyperlink different words in a story, and gamers have really taken this up if you search for Twine stories online to create really intricate word games because you can go in different paths, you can hit dead ends, you can loop back to different parts of the narrative. Um, so it's really been taken up by the creative community in interesting ways. Um, I ask my students to, again, remediate something and to think about how digital storytelling makes them think differently about the stories that they're invested in. So for this um, assignment, they bring their own story. Um, and then I have a three hour class, so this allows me to do bigger things. But then we have another workshop where I give them, within the three hours, I'm able to give them the basic training in Twine and HTML, and then enough time to produce um, a piece like this. <coughs> so this is by a wonderful student, FNIS student, um, Chloe Erlinson, um, who decided that she wanted to remediate a poem that her mother wrote um, uh, at the same age that Chloe now is. Um, so this was a very much an homage um, to her mother. And these, the poem is called Where the Red Receives Me. Um, it's about the red and the Assiniboine rivers in Winnipeg where they meet. This is a picture from the prairie that Chloe was able to put in. And then you can see um, what Twine allows you to do is to hyperlink different portions of the text, and that allows you to move through the text in different ways. Um, so she has um, thought carefully about the text she wants to put in there. Um, and then you're also able to fold in basic photos. Um, so as you can move, this is a really sort of a beautiful um, homage to her mother and her grandmother, which she was then able to send out um, to her mom and her grandma in Winnipeg. Um, uh, because we do it through, there's, I have access to free hosting as well too. So we host these, we put them online, and then you can share them with your community instantaneously. Um, so it's within a three hour. Um, 
session. And then finally, um, this is a new project. We've just started this year thanks to um, funding from the department. Um, this year we were able to, uh, much to my, well, I was very happy to be able to welcome and give money to um, Elma Tailfeathers and to Jess Hallenbrook um, to come in and lead a two day, two weekend workshop, two days over two weekends um, in digital storytelling. Um, so both of these women, very accomplished filmmakers, um, award-winning filmmakers, uh, and they came in and basically the first day we gave a crash course in storyboarding, um, shooting, tech, all the things that you need to work to tell a story, um, but with basic equipment. So students were encouraged to bring in their iPhones, um, their, uh, their Canon Rebels, whatever tech they had. Um, then they had a week to shoot, and the second weekend we came back and we gave a crash course in editing. Again, using free open source uh, editing software. Um, teaching them how to then put that story together um, and how to get it out there. These stories are in production. I'm always amazed by the creativity that students bring to these projects and the ambition. Um, we're hoping to have a screening for them in December, maybe at Stagotan. Um, but we're going to have three films that came out of this project, um, all of which are quite amazing. I'm going to show you the trailer, because again, I did not, this, the trailer was not an assignment, but students jumped all over this. This is from one of the students, um, Nicole Cardinal, um, and her piece, Decolonizing in Motion. Again, I'm sorry the sound. As you can see, um, what this group has decided to do um, is tell the story of Nicole's engagement at university um, and her struggle and alienation she finds um, in this space as an indigenous woman, and also the soul that she's found through beating. She also started a hashtag in the class um, called Decolonizing One Beat at a Time. Um, where she brings together ideas of how beating um, can lend itself to this practice of decolonization. So the full film actually shows her in her beating practice. It recreates a scene um, where she was really angry um, in a classroom and she actually flips over the desk and storms out. Um, it's a very dramatic, um, fun scene. Um, but that's, she's working to put all that um, together um, um, for a film at the end. Again, really just demonstrating how giving technology is allowing these students to tell some really beautiful and unique stories um, that they are more than eager to share and giving them ways to disseminate that and contributing to, um, in some small way, to a decolonization of the UBC campus um, and lending more attention to the indigenous narratives, the important indigenous narratives that are coming out of the university. Um, so I'll leave it there. I've um, talked long enough. So if people have any questions or Thank you for, for listening. Yeah. I have several questions, but I'll open this one. Sure. Um, I think it's wonderful when you do these kinds of projects that you're getting your students to do. And as somebody who also tries to bring some digital projects into the classroom, albeit in a more kind of uh, historical, both with a more historical focus. I'm just wondering, what are the challenges that you're finding? I mean, are they, I mean, the, the story of trying to get the, the floppies <laughs> totally fascinating. Right. Um, and I guess that's your own historical challenge there, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to recreate that. But working with students, what, like, what are the challenges? Are they resistant to trying to learn a new technology that you think is impossible? Are there issues with publishing their work? online? Like, I'm, I'm just curious, because you work in a different area. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. For the most part, um, and it, it's really marketed as, as a new media class, but for the most part, students are very um, excited, and we get to the radio station really quickly, because I think it's a great way to build excitement and to get them. The radio, I'm, I do radio because I did it for 10 years myself, and it's, it's a place of safe haven for me, so it's like, how can I get back in the radio station? So we try to, I try to drum up excitement with that. Um, they're, not, they're not afraid or resistant to the tech, but uh, one of the biggest challenges, especially now that 401F is growing, is just the range of skill level. So especially teaching something like Twine, I have students who know how to code, 
um, and can build a website with very, thin, I basically just need to give them the site and they, they're on it. And then I have students who just don't, they don't even know how to close a tag. And so they're like, there. I have one person on this side who is, I, I need to just go into really detail. And then somebody else who is beyond what I can even do. Um, so finding a place where I can keep that classroom space engaging for that continuum of students um, is often a challenge. Um, and so I'm trying to do more sort of peer review and help in those instances, but that's still something I battle with. I'm also still in the process of working out rubrics for grading this stuff. Right now, we do the two creative assignments in the class. The rest is very analytical. Um, they, they do a blog to submit their analytic work. Um, but um, the, the Twine piece and the podcast are just pass-fail assignments right now. It's basically like, come show up to the workshops and submit something, and you're gonna get, you get you'll pass it. Um, I probably will think about nuancing that more for the future, um, and I really, but I need to sit down with some other folks um, in the community and, and really, how do I grade this stuff? What is a rubric? that I can establish, um, maybe in relation with the class. Well, especially since it's phase three, phase two. Yeah. A technical conference, let alone grading things that have personal meaning, and that are creative, that's a whole range of challenges. Yeah, exactly. And we'll get, like, like this very poetic piece, then I had another student who actually just he put a CV up using Twine, <laughs> and it was like sort of a creative way to move through a CV. Both great projects, but totally different from each other. So it's like, how do I think of those pieces in relation to each other and, and grade them in a critical way? Is it something I'm still I'm struggling in? Coming back to the, the DH community for advice. Mm -hmm. You were speaking about, obviously, the, the issues with um, the technology that's even stopped 12 years ago, 13, 12 years ago now. Um, and the issues of being able to use it. Um, and you know, I think digital archiving is really entering into the conversation of the problem of the digital archiving, that right. you're archiving something for, what, six years, seven, eight years before it becomes not an archive anymore because you can't access it. Right. And I'm wondering if, um, I, I don't know the conversation as much being a settler, um, but are there any reservations among different people in indigenous communities with using digital archiving considering those limitations around digital archiving um, because storytelling is obviously so important is there any fear about moving towards digital archiving in the sense that it can be so easy to lose those things in such a short time yeah no it's a really a really smart um, important question and I think it's not even necessarily I think it's even a bigger conversation about reservations or anxieties about the archive itself, mm -hmm. um, right? And what that does um, when we're talking about museums and um, now these ideas of digital repatriation and what it means to archive indigenous knowledge, which itself is compelled and driven by a sort of settler colonial desire to preserve. Um, and I've had some really, some of the best conversations I've had with my students were around these ideas and um, what it might mean to create a piece on the internet that you just let die. We have because there is this impulse that we have to save this work, we have to go back and save it. But a lot of indigenous um, um, ceremonial work or, um, is left and it is meant to decay in that spot. So I actually had a student write a paper about what it would mean to create something in a digital space that was not meant to be preserved at all, but was just, you were just meant to watch it die as the plugins and technologies decayed and it sort of flickered um, on and off. So I think it's a very nuanced um, theoretical question that really applies across digital and indigenous studies um, that we need to think about is what is the archive in indigenous cyberspace? Um, is it necessary? Um, can we indigenize that archive in that space? Um, and how can we engage with it in a more rigorous, way that um, responds to my interests as a researcher and someone who is invested in the preservation, but also to the interests um, of the community where that work comes from. Thank you for the question. Well, that actually goes, a, a different question that I had, but I'm, I'm really intrigued by this idea of kind of the decay. Um, 
what was the what was the conversation around cyber powwow in that particular moment? Because I mean, this is this is obviously uh, an archive that is incredibly difficult to access. <clears throat> why why try? What what is the kind of what is the ethic ethical relationship to cyber powwow for you? Right. Is, is, is that one of the cultural forms that's meant to decay, or was that always meant to be something that continues to live? Because not everything ceremonial is meant to decay. Yeah, no. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. Um, and I think I had to bring a lot of, especially after class conversations, I had to think about that quite a bit. And really, it came down for me, um, and something I try and do with all my research now is, is having a conversation with the artist. It's going to Scalinati and saying, what was the intent? with this work, engaging her in that conversation. Um, and I think you're right that, again, as I said, part of what she always is reminding me of is this was meant to be a live piece. These are not static representations. So what your students are seeing now, it's not really, it's a, it's a ghost of what cyber power was supposed to be. So you're not, you're never going to engage with the same thing as it was. So in that sense, it's a very, um, cyberspace becomes a very performative idea like to draw on, on performance studies and the idea of ephemerality um, that, that I think needs to be engaged in different ways, that this is not always something that is meant to last. Um, so working, again, with Scalinati, it was really a matter of talking to her and saying, well, what? Is this something that we should? Would you, do you want this to be, to be preserved? Um, this is why I think it's important. This is what the contribution I think you've made to the field and why other scholars working in it need to know what your work is doing. Um, and luckily, she agreed. <laughs> um, but there are so many different artists involved in this work that hopefully, at some point, we'll be able to bring in more of that original community and, and ask questions about this. So it could be very different from what Lloyd Blondo thinks or Archer thinks about what their work is supposed to do. Who's that man? Irwin. He does things. Dean Irvine. Dean Irvine. I heard a lecture by Dean Irvine a couple of years ago. And he's done all of his, uh, he, he was pondering the idea that for a number of decades in Canada, there seemed to be no Aboriginal art, okay? It just seemed to have stopped. And he didn't believe that this could be the case. So what he did, he started going like to um, libraries and discovering catalogs. You know about this research too. And he digitized all of these and they're now available somewhere, I'm not exactly certain where, and in fact was able to create an entire history. There wasn't a gap. Uh, it was it was a form of forgetting. So right. paradoxically, he brought life to, to a continuous tradition of First Nations art uh, during a time when people thought, well, there wasn't any, and then there was a great revival in the 60s, you know. Right. So that's sort of the inverse of this in a certain way, but right. it had a very good outcome because it basically rewrites the history of First Nations art in, in, in Canada. Right, yeah. Oh, so cool. maybe this can be seen as part of that, an equivalent sort of, but moving right into the digital world where Dean was still dealing with paper, you know, paper mm. artifacts and digitizing. Right, and I think part of what Cyber Power did that was so important was really to rethink what Indigenous art could be. Yeah. Certainly what Indigenous yes. art was online yes. at the time yes. was if it was there, it was 32-bit megapixel pictures of usually ceremonial pieces mm -hmm. that then were put up, and again, sort of without thought that this is indigenous art. What Cyber Power was doing that was very contemporary, very live, and in the moment, I mean, it's sort of really exploding the box of what yeah. indigenous art um, could be, yeah. and that it doesn't have to be a mask. No. Um, so um, I, that, I think that in itself was a really important part yeah. of what Kawanati um, yeah. got. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? The assembly. One, one real quick yes, point of clarification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Geolocation. Mm -hmm. All of the, the geographic information there, how close you are to a reserve, will depend on where you're accessing the, the site, right? So if you're yeah. in Manitoba, if you're near Winnipeg, it's completely different. Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, and that's actually the code is buggy right now, so that part's not actually working. So luckily I had a screen grab. But it's a really, um, I was doing job talks last year, and so I was talking about this research all over the place. And it becomes a, a, a fascinating teaching tool 
So I was in Halifax, for instance, and I bring up those slides, and it tells me how far we are from, and then it tells me how far we are from the nearest reserve in relation to that university, and then I say, and what is that reserve? And what is the community that lives there? And it, you would, well, maybe you would be surprised, but the blank stares that I got in the majority of those rooms. Um, and then that, of course, is an amazing point to step in and say, well, this, now this is why we need to think about the relationship between the university and these spaces and our responsibility and accountability and the fact that this university is also on indigenous territory. And so it just opens up. The geolocation is just a great moment to open up so many different kinds of conversations. Um, it's just, and again, I didn't even notice it the first few times, but I, it's been really useful to me in my pedagogy and my, my talking about these issues. David, thank you very much. Thank you.